will start the final plenary. Um, this one's entitled, The More That You Read, The More Things You Will Know. The More That You Learn, The More Places You Go. It is my very great pleasure to welcome Peter Anthony to the lectern. Peter Anthony is an Associate Director of Executive Education at Australian Catholic University. In his role, he helps health professionals acquire the necessary clinical and non-clinical skills to achieve patient outcomes. He has a master's in communication and has run workshops on influence and positive coaching in 12 countries over 16 years. Please welcome Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Press the green button. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. I, I just wanted to begin this afternoon on a on a personal note, and that personal note is to have a real live gratitude visit. Because seven years ago in Manly, I woke up uh, with a very unusually sore throat. Um, pretty quickly, I couldn't breathe. I was sent to the good people at the emergency at Manly Hospital. Um, I was diagnosed with acute epiglottitis, and I literally couldn't breathe, and I thought I was going to die, literally. And uh, the good emergency nurses and staff at Manly Hospital induced me into a coma, which I was in for five days. Um, and I did survive, uh, which, is, which is cool. But uh, there's a lot of people like me who are recipients of the care from people like you. And I'm here partly as a gratitude visit, uh, grateful for you and your great work, and the sort of commitment you've got at a conference like this to even sharpen your skills even more. So from me and fellow patients of yours to you, Thank you with an enormous amount of gratitude. Okay, so thank you, thank you. Thank you. So I can, I can see you guys like tails and heads. Um, I like evidence base. And what I'm, what I'm talking to this afternoon is the psychology of influence from a very strong evidence base. And there's a couple of real life experiments I'll be doing with you this afternoon, with you and for you because part of what I'm suggesting to you is a whole idea around mindfulness. Now to help us with stage one of this experiment, I'm gonna need you to stand up. And you'll need, you'll need to be far enough from the person alongside you that if you went like this, you won't hit them in the head. Yeah, don't want any like <laughs> injuries here this afternoon. And, and I'll be doing the same thing as you. What I'll be asking you to do is to, uh, is to bring your arms apart in a moment like this. And not yet, but <laughs> what I'll be asking you to do is bring your arms apart, clapping them together and bringing them apart again with your eyes closed. Okay? So arms apart, eyes closed. On the count of go, we clap and go. And you can sit back down again. Thank you. Now, this psychology of influence, it's a big topic to cover in 30 minutes. Um, what I am talking about is uh, your ability to influence people's outcomes, whether they're colleagues, whether they're patients, whether they're doctors, whether they're friends. Uh, whether they're a romantic partner uh, in your life. There is a lot, of, a lot of work that's gone into helping people with so-called conversational influence. Now, when, when you think about this whole body of work called positive psychology, what would you say is the, and, and you think of that as a body of work that says, this is all about helping people uh, do great by feeling great. What would you say is the number one marker of success that the scientists have found, what, since 1998? If you say, look, I want to be happy and I want to be effective in what I do, the number one marker from a positive psychology perspective would be what? What would you say it is? Is it money? No. Is it, is it good looks and charm? No. <laughs> so, what, what would you say it is? Health? No, not even health. Before health, above health. Yeah, so it's, it's, part, it's part of happiness and it's, it's relationships. The, 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 number, the number one marker of our effectiveness as human beings is the depth and quality of the relationships that we have. Relationships with ourselves um, and with our colleagues, with our patients and so forth. And when you think about the quality of those relationships, the quality of those relationships is the quality of the conversations that take place within those relationships. And what I wanted to focus on this afternoon was to um, give you some ideas about how we can have 
uh, higher, higher quality relationships and achieve more with the people that you need to achieve them with. Now, I'm suggesting this mindful that there's a lot on your plate. Yeah? So I'm suggesting some very practical tools you could use pretty much right away, almost immediately, and ones that might take a little, a little longer to, to practice and implement. Does that make sense so far? You guys are really quiet. <laughs> really, really quiet. It's Friday afternoon. So if, 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 you think about, if you think about having a conversation with somebody, you think about, okay, I need to influence them to do something, or I'd like to. I'm in a patient environment, a healthcare environment, and I've got a situation where I need to influence a patient to, to um, take a treatment regime or comply with a, a particular um, treatment. Uh, if, if you're attempting to influence someone, there's a paradox because you've got what you want and they want what they want. If there's no, if there's no conflict, there's if no influence taking place. You're just telling them that they accept. So when you've got to influence, you think, well, I've got four, I've got four ways I can do this. So I've got an outcome, you've got an outcome. We can be, and your outcome focuses across the bottom and their, their outcome um, is across, uh, across the vertical side. You can still be totally indifferent and just not care, just let it case sera, sera. Take the Doris Day approach to influence and just whatever will be, will be. And that's fair enough too for some, for some things. Or you might say, look, I'll be appeasing. I'll just be really, really nice and friendly and hopefully I'll be nice and friendly back. And I had the good fortune yesterday to spend the entire day at Westmead Hospital. And I was uh, giving three, uh, working with three different groups. And the first group I worked with was the JMOs um, there. And uh, their influence strategy was to be appeasing and friendly and nice uh, and be respectful and be, do, what that, do what they were told. And we had a talk about when that might work and when that might not work. So appeasing might work, indifference might work. Bullying, uh, I'm sure there's none of that in this, in this room, but I know in hospital environments bullying exists because I've worked in them for long enough to know that it's there. That's one way of achieving an outcome is to tell someone or intimidate somebody into doing something. But you're probably obviously burning a lot of relationship, uh, creating a toxic culture, plus not getting the best possible outcome. Now all the evidence base is suggesting to us that collaborative relationships and collaborative conversations are the most effective way to go when you're in a long-term relationship. And long-term in the science state says the chance of being with that person again exceeds two and three. So the research is saying collaboration works. And the evolutionary biologists are telling us that we are hardwired in our DNA to collaborate. And one of the reasons we, we, got, we lasted so long was we learned to do things together. So how do you do that, particularly in a stressful emergency environment, with, with the question that I'd be asking if I was sitting in your, in your, in your seat? Makes sense so far? Happy for you to ask questions if you like. I can hear you down here. It's a great room, this, isn't it? It's a great room to talk in. So um, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? We're talking about a thing called a collaborative conversation. And like most things in, in this space, they've got definitions. And this definition uh, tells us it's a, it's a mindful, intentional, and I'll talk a lot about mindfulness in a moment. It's a mindful conversation, it's an intentional conversation, it's a dynamic conversation. It involves a two-way exchange of things, like information, feelings, emotions, and it leaves both people better off. There is, there is a psychology in this conversation which is like the wisdom of the crowd. And the psychology of the conversation uh, leaves both people better off than the smartest member could. So no matter how smart each person is, if we do it appropriately and do it well, we're both better off and ideally we've got a much better and more effective healthcare outcome to boot. Now what is the research telling us about the outcomes of conversations like this, of collaboration? Well there's, there's three different spaces or three different groups that get the outcome. The whole network or culture gets the outcome of better uh, relationships, a much more constructive culture, and better health outcomes. The patients get the benefit of what many of you may know a lot about, which is this whole empathetic communication piece. If the patient feels as if you understand them, that can be curative of them by itself. And that relationship is created by your presence and by how you're talking with them, as, as you would know. And a lot of work's been done around um, compliance and how patients comply more with treatment regimes if the health professional is reported as being empathetic or understanding their needs. Now, who, can I ask you just a, a question? 
Who in this room, who in this room feels completely understood by the people around them? I don't mean the people in the conference, I mean in the normal world that you walk in. Who feels completely understood? How many hands have I got? None? None. Really cool, really cool. And the reason that's cool is that I've been asking that question in different places around the world since 1998. I almost never get a hand up. And the reason I'm asking you that question is that when, when you look for what people are looking for in a relationship or a conversation in a health environment, what they're looking for is someone who uniquely understands my needs and my environment. So the number one need on, on, the, on the receiving end um, is uh, that, that sense of understanding and empathy and it's curative of them by itself. For nurses, there's some really great work that's been done at the Institute of Positive Psychology at Strathfield um, around what happens when you have a collaborative conversation like this. And one of the interesting things here is it reduces stress enormously, reduces your levels of stress, and it increases your level of compassion. Self-compassion and other compassion, like compassion for others. So it works on the empathy. It's got a wing of empathy and a wing of, uh, a wing of compassion. So there's some really useful reasons to be doing what I'm going to recommend you to do. Makes sense so far? Yeah, cool. Okay, okay. And this, this is the summary of what I'm going to be sharing with you today. This is a dot C, a stop connect. Stop and connect. And the stop, uh, or the full stop, refers to mindfulness. And the connect piece re refers to a particular type of conversation I'm going to request that you have. Okay? Who here has done work on mindfulness before? Yeah? A lot of you. Yeah? Have you, done, have you done work before in, in mindful communication? A little bit? A little bit. Okay. Okay. Let's get you standing up again, if I could. This is, this is the second part of the experiment I was doing earlier. So you'll be doing the same thing again but different. So make sure no one's close enough that if you go like this you're going to bang and hit them. So in a moment I'm going to be asking you to do the same thing again. To, bring you, to close your eyes, to bring your arms apart and clap, but just clap once, not, not keep clapping, <laughs> not keep clapping, just clap once. And I'm going to ask you to keep your eyes closed, and I'll be talking to you for about 20 seconds as you've got your eyes closed, about just helping you become a bit more mindful in, in that space. Okay, is that fair? Okay, so I've got hands up, your eyes closed. On the count of go, we clap. We feel that tingling sensation on our hands. Feel that warm and welcoming darkness behind our eyes. That strange feeling of our arms on our shoulders. The sensation of the weight inside our shoes, our little toes and big toes and heels. And when we're ready, we can open our eyes. Okay, so together some apart. It's really interesting. Sit back down again if you like. Now, I don't, and this obviously is not going to be... <laughs> now, did it feel different second time to first time? Did it feel different? Yeah? What was the... If you think of the first time you did that, on a scale of zero to ten, where would you be in terms of being present and mindful? For time number one, you'd be where? One. <laughs> You'd be one. Time number two, you would be two. Further up, two. One and a half. Or definitely, definitely, definitely more. Now, what we um, what we're finding uh, what we're finding in the research is that when when you're when you're more mindful when you're communicating, some really magical things happen. Really magical things happen. One thing happens is that people report a higher level of empathy that you're communicating with. The second thing that happens is that your compassion rises. The third thing that happens is that you notice things more and make better, more effective decisions. So what I'm going to suggest to you is that step one in this, in this space um, is to be present. My trick of being present, which I'm using right now, because I like to present mindfully, is I use the toe technique. Have you heard of the toe technique? I just like to wiggle my toes. You can't see me doing it. But when I wiggle my toes, I get present, I get mindful, I can feel my toes, and I can feel my heels. I get present that I'm here, and I can do a much better job for you when I'm here than if I'm somewhere else. Like at tonight's dinner or wherever else I, I, could, I could be. So let's, let's think about the, the conversational model. That's the mindful piece. 
And what I'm going to recommend is that um, you spend the day in those communication environments communicating mindfully. What about, what about the conversation piece? You can see here that there's, there's three spirits to this conversation and there's six steps. Like every model, there's always steps, isn't there? So one of those spirits is, is, the, is the mindfulness. Um, the second is, is optimism, an optimistic explanatory style. Have you done work around Seligman's work on optimism and explanatory style? No? No, okay. Um, when you're, when you're influencing outcomes, people are more influenced by optimists than pessimists. And I'm not suggesting that you, you don't tell the truth. I'm just saying that the way that you're interpreting what you're saying and the way that you're explaining what you're, what you're saying, the recipients of your message are much more influenced by someone who's an optimist. Now, optimists aren't people that are happy, happy, joy, joy, walk through the weeds. It's not, not like that. In this, in this case, Optimism is a sense that when bad things, when, when bad events are happening, they're, they're shorter lived and have less impact, and, and the, the better events or the good events are longer lasting and um, have a wider uh, range of impacts. The top line there is, is the level of authenticity, and I can't imagine this would be a big issue for the people um, in this room, but you'll find that when you're being most authentic, when you're being most genuine, if you like, um, that's when you're most impactful and most, most influential. The, the best explanation I've seen of this comes from Brene Brown. Have you come across Brene? B-R-E-N-E Brown. Um, she's, um, just check her out if, you, if you'd like to learn more about authenticity. She uses this beautiful phrase in her TED talk and she talks about um, courage from the ancient Latin cur, C-U-R. It's about telling the story of who you are with your whole heart and turning up authentically. Um, then we've got our, our steps. This is every conversation has a step. And I'm, what I'm going to recommend is that you do either one or all of these steps. Now, it's going to be hard to do to go from zero to all six, but at least pick one that you think might be a favourite for you and use that the next time that you're engaging in these, these types of conversations. So step number one in these um, influential conversations is having a goal, a deliberate goal. So I'm, I'm deliberately thinking about what I'd like to change. And I want to change one of three things. I want to change either how someone's thinking, I want to change how they're feeling, or I'd like to change what they're doing, how they're behaving. Yeah? I wish this would work with my daughter, but it doesn't work as well with my daughter as it does in, in, in real life. Which of those do you think is the most important, would you say? I, I want to change how you feel, I want to change how you think, or change what you're doing. Which do you think, which, how would you rank them? Huh? Feel first, yeah. Feel first. Feel first. Feel first. The, 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 number, the number one thing um, they're looking for is a sense of certainty, a sense of confidence, a, a, sense, of, a sense of being understood. The second step is, is relating. The second step is relating. And I'm going to actually do one more. Can I get you standing up again? And could you just, just find a partner, find someone you can partner up with alongside you? No, you know, three recently, right? Have I got to four or just after? About five minutes after. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You got a partner? Pen. So can you turn and face your partner? Perfect. Perfect. Now, just stand close enough that if you put your fingers out, you're not touching their shoulders, you're touching their fingers. <laughs> Perfect. And hands down? Now, Folks, what you'll need to do, I need a person A and a person B in each group. So pick an A and a B. An A and a B. Okay, okay. So hands up the A's. Fantastic. Now A's, what you'll need to do is you need to tell B's, that your, your person B, what you find really relaxing. Or what you find relaxing. But you need to use a particular satire style, and this satire style is called the blamer. Okay? So A is telling B how, what you find relaxing and you're using this satire style. So A is turn side on to the B's like this. Bring your front foot forward. Bring your, your right finger out like this. You're pointing at their chest. And what you're saying to them is what I find very relaxing. Just like so. Go, 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 go. <laughs> OK, 
OK. Perfect. OK, they've time. They've time. <laughs> they've time. They've time. They've time. OK, now switch. Now B's turn. B's turn, fascia A, turn side on, finger out to their chest. What I find very relaxing. Go, go. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Now, can you give your can you give your partner a big round of applause? And they can sit back down again. Yeah. The reason the reason we're looking at that is as a reminder that the initial level of rapport is a is a physical level. It's, it's between 50 and 60% physical initially. initially. So we're looking at, at understanding their style and matching their style initially, and then we're looking at understanding the, the means or the frames that they're coming from. The third step then, obviously, is to take the lead in the conversation. And there's four magic words in lead, which is who, why, what, and how. So it's who we are, why the conversation's taking place, what the outcome is that we're after, and how we plan to arrive at that with, our, uh, with the structure that we're, we're suggesting. Um, then, of course, the most important piece, which is understanding. And understanding, and the reason this is the most important piece is that this is the piece that, that the person you're attempting to influence wants to feel the best, the one that will feel understood, not cured or fixed. Um, just, I want, to feel, I want to feel understood. And as we found earlier, Nobody in this room feels understood by the folks that are around them. What we're looking at here is understanding how they're making decisions. How they're making decisions about whether they're agreeing with you or not. And the sort of things we're after is what sort of, what sort of criteria do they use to make decisions? What do those criteria mean? And um, what, what do they do most? What do they do most to avoid? Whether they're making recommendations and after we recommend, whether they're yes, no, or maybe. Of course, the yes is great, no is even better still. And if we get a maybe, we want to translate that into a, a yes that's worth, that's worth having. So um, I'll go back a bit. So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to leave you guys with um, a copy of a book that explains this in a lot more, a lot more detail, uh, which looks like, looks like this, um, 40,000 words of uh, on, on the conversation. I'm going to leave that with Marg so she can do with that what works best um, for the conference. But one last piece of this, and I've got about three more minutes to go, get you standing up again. <laughs> now, now we've, done, we've, done, we've done clapping first, but w when you think about mindful communication, you need to be mindful and have a focusing device at the same time, as we know. Some people use the breath, some people use a bell. What we're going to do is we're going to use music as our focusing device this afternoon. And it's music that you'll be creating, a song that you'll be creating. OK? Now, now, now I'm, I'm going to go, and Marg knows, Marg knows this one. Uh, now, the, the, one, the one that we're going to use, and I'm, I'm going to go first, I'm going to go first. It's a, it's a song called Lola. Have you heard of Lola? It goes, Lola! La 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 la. That's how it goes. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to clap, bring our hands apart with our eyes open, and sing Lola, la 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 as our focusing device. Okay? Let's, let's have a warm up round. Hands apart, hands together. Lola, la 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 la. Now, I had, I had my Lola, I had my Lola de uh, calibrating device checked recently. And that came to a 6.3. And what, what Marg insisted on is she said, she said, get them to an 8. She said, get them to an 8. They said, OK, Marg, I'll get them to an 8. Let's see if we can do an 8. Yeah, you're good for this. Hands apart, hands together, apart. Lola, la, 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 la. And well done. Great job. Thank you. Thank, thank you. There we go. Thank you very much. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Oh, please take your very lovely looking watch. Watch. For my time. Oh, that's mine. That's yours. You Thanks. take that. Thank you take very that. much. Pleasure, pleasure.